Good evening from Singapore. My name is Kevin Nash. I'm the Deputy Registrar and Centre Director of the Singapore International Arbitration Centre. And on behalf of everyone at SIC, we are very pleased that you can attend the latest installment in the SIC International Webinar Series 2020. Today we'll be looking at virtual hearings, contemporary perspectives. We are particularly pleased because in addition to Mr. Gary Bourne and Dr. Michael Wong, we also have our friends and institutional colleagues from ICSID and the PCA. Singapore has a long-standing relationship and agreements with ICSID and the PCA, and these cases, cases under the auspices of ICSID and PCA have been heard at Maxwell Chambers in Singapore. In addition, in 2019, PCA started administering cases out of Singapore, joining SIC, ICC, ICDR, WIPO, and the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration. As is the case with many of SIC's webinars, all of these panelists need no introduction, but I would be grateful if all the attendees allow me this minor indulgence to give the background and a summary of the experience of our panelists. Starting with Mr. Gary Bourne, he is, of course, one of the most well-known figures in all of arbitration. He is the president of the SIC Court of Arbitration and Chair of the International Arbitration Practice Group at Wilmer, Cutler, Pickering, Hale and Door, LLP. Gary has participated in more than 600 arbitrations as counsel and arbitrator, including some of the most high value and complex arbitrations. He is also the author of the leading treaties, uh, three volumes in arbitration, international commercial arbitration. And these volumes, of course, occupy a prominent spot on the bookshelves of all members of the SIC Secretariat and really everyone in arbitration. Dr. Michael Huang, senior counsel, practices as a barrister and an international arbitrator and is one of the doyens of Singapore arbitration. He was one of the first batch of lawyers in Singapore to make senior counsel and across uh, now 50 years of experience as, as a lawyer, he has been a judicial commissioner of the Supreme Court of Singapore and served as chief justice of the DIFC courts. Ms. Hara Minguez Almeida, team leader, legal counsel from ICSID in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining ICSID, Hara worked with the Permanent Court of Arbitration following her work in private practice advising on international dispute resolution. Jara, Hara, thank you particularly for being here and for getting up early. As a side point, in addition to your experience at ICSID and the conduct of virtual hearings, all of us at SRC are very interested in the progress of the ICSID rule revision following the release of the fourth consultation paper. Thank you, Hara. Mr. Martin Doe, Senior Legal Counsel at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. In this capacity, has worked with tribunals in some of the largest and most complex interstate, investor state, and commercial cases administered by the PCA. He is also regularly called upon uh, to assist in the diplomatic work of the PCA with its member states and other organizations. I also have it on fairly good authority that he's a fellow Canadian. Thank you. Martin, thank you for being here. Okay, we have a, a lot of ground to cover. Even still, an appropriate starting point might be how all the institutions are managing case administration through the COVID-19 pandemic. For SIC's part, SIC has provided a, a series of updates and most re recently an open letter from the president of the SIC Court of Arbitration. I would encourage all of the attendees to go to the SIC website look at these advisory notes and particularly look at uh, Gary's letter, which introduces some specific COVID related FAQs and the introduction of a live chat feature whereby SIC's, SIC users will be able to get immediate real time assistance from SIC legal counsel. So that's a bit of the view from SIC. Hara, how is ICSID managing cases during the COVID-19 pandemic? Are cases progressing? What is the general state of play? Well, thank you to everyone and uh, hello to everyone. I hope you are well and are staying safe. And thank you, Kevin and everyone at SIC for inviting us uh, to participate today. It's a great honor to be in this panel and uh, we are very grateful for the opportunity of sharing our views and how Exit is managing cases these days. We have been working from home now for over a month and um, it's been challenging at times but it's working well and it's pretty much business as usual at the time uh, right now we have obviously had to implement some changes and one of them is that we ha had been planning to go green and only do electronic filings for some time it was part of our rule amendment proposals 
and now at the end in light of the circumstances we decided to implement it immediately the other big change is obviously virtual hearings but we're going to be discussing this in detail so i won't go into more information on that right now thank you thank you Laura. Mar martin uh the view from the permanent court of arbitration how are you dealing with covid 19 uh how, how are you running the cases how are cases progressing uh, I, I echo a lot of what Hada has said. I, I think a lot of it is business as usual. I think there's three major areas that I might speak to. One is remote work, and I think we're all getting used to uh, working remotely there. And, and thankfully at the BCA, we've, we've I mean, the, the, the majority of our hearings take place overseas. Our staff is in normal times uh, traveling quite frequently. Um, we have several offices across the globe uh, that we already need to connect, and so we have robust systems for that. Um, the second is electronic submissions, and there I think everybody has already been moving steadily towards electronic submissions. Uh, most of the rule sets that we work under and that most others work under already foresee these, and tribunals have obviously sped up that, that transition recently and then the third is is again virtual hearings what do we do with with hearings that are affected by uh travel restrictions and yeah that's it's a million dollar question that that <laughs> follows for the rest of this webinar <laughs> it, it's interesting because pca and ICSID really have been at the forefront of, of conducting hearings by virtual means but arbitration institutional arbitration generally uh we're actually quite well prepared for the different way to run cases and to manage cases. So it's the same with us. SIC is fully operational. Uh, all the SIC staff are telecommuting, but it's a lot of these practices and procedures that have been put in place over the course of the years that, that has let us uh, run cases relatively seamlessly. Gary, if, if I could pass it over to you in your capacity as the uh, president of the SIC Court of Arbitration, what do you see uh, from SIC the general progression of cases. I know that we're still emailing you at all hours of the night, but uh, what is the view from the president? Just very briefly, um, and to echo Kevin's thanks to both Ixid and the PCA, to, to Martin and to Hara for taking their time and sharing their experience and expertise with, with us and, and our viewers. At SIC, as Kevin's already said, and much like both Para and, and Martin have, have also said, we're open for business and cases are continuing to be filed and to be heard as if this were normal times. One of the things that I think we've done in particular aimed at trying to make the transition to COVID circumstances as seamless as possible for our users is to initiate training for the SIC council who administer our various cases. We've used the <clears throat> chief technology officers of, of local firms in Singapore and, and elsewhere, Drew Napier, Alan Gledhill, and other firms who've, who've very kindly shared their technical expertise with our council who are on call to assist tribunals who at the end of the day are the ones who need to conduct and arrange individual virtual hearings. But our council with that training in our experience have been able to assist tribunals and also parties in making the logistical arrangements for virtual hearings. Thus far, although I know some national courts have encountered difficulties with remaining open for business, I think at SIC, like, like Ixid and the PCA, there really hasn't been much of an impact on how cases can be administered. I think some tribunals have chosen to, to run things in a more deliberate fashion, but certainly we are open for business as, as if this were normal times. Yeah, it, it, exactly right. And we have a lot of emergency arbitrator proceedings that are happening right now, as discussed in as part of the webinar series uh, we had an emergency arbitration hearing that was conducted completely remotely, worked very well, uh, very seamless. Uh, Mar Martin, let me put it back to you in terms of the framework, the hardware and software for virtual hearings. I think for a lot of even experienced people in international arbitration, they may have not had the experience of a full remote hearing. It could be that perhaps one or two witnesses are participating by virtual means. Tell us how it works at the PCA in terms of the hardware and software. What does a, 
a, a virtual hearing look like at the permanent court of arbitration? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I, I think I think the first comment that I that I'd make in that regard is is just that this is not something that's entirely novel. We've we've been doing this for for quite a number of years. Um, there had different phases of proceedings, different participants who've been connecting remotely um, through various means. What we now have recently in the last few months is a lot more experience when you actually have to run a, a hearing entirely virtually with people relying on the, the hardware and software that they have personally and, and at home uh, there, which is I think uh, then having us explore various different various different options um and i I'd, I'd say the big questions fall into into two categories the, the first is what platform do you use and then the second is how do you then layer all the support and and extra functionality and, and services that you need as to the platform um the the, the platform that the pca has actually found uh, best and most versatile is the one that we're on right now is 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 zoom um, there and that's the one that we've been building out uh, internally within within the PCA in order to be able to use here. At the same time, Zoom has had uh, some concerns about privacy and, and security um, there and therefore we've also identified a, a, a number of alternatives in particular if there's already a preferred platform that, that the parties or the tribunal wish to use or, or any of any concerns of any kind rule out any particular platform. In that respect, you have WebEx and BlueJeans, which I think are the next option. Um, interpretation is actually one of the trickiest issues that we've found, and it works well in Zoom, but then Kudo is actually a, a, a platform that's really designed around the interpretation aspect. Then you have iNetwork that we have some ex experience with, which is now being used by the, U the UK courts. Um, Tixeo is yet another one being used by the French. Kevin, you might want to um, re-ask the question for, for Michael or for me or Hara. Uh, the question on... Uh... Right. We might have lost Mark. Uh, I see. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll I'll pass it over. I'll pass it over to uh, uh, Har. Well, uh, Martin gets assigned back back on. How does it look at Ixit uh, in terms of the experience and offerings for virtual hearings? Martin has communicated. I guess a variety of platforms can be used. You've got the PCA technical support. How are, how does it work at Ixit? So it's my turn to echo most of uh, a lot of Martin's comments. Um, we've also been doing virtual hearings for quite some time. Um, we, in fact, like 60% of the 200 hearings that we hosted last year were done remotely. And most of these were like first sessions and case management conferences. And then at hearings, I think uh, almost all hearings will have a virtual component where like at least one witness and expert or expert will participate via video conferences. Other things that we've done in the past when uh, people were not confined in their homes is that we would have like hub hearings where some people would be joining from the IDRC, other people from the World Bank facilities in DC or the World Bank facilities in Paris and, and they would be all connected via VC and that uh, has worked very well. Now obviously in this pandemic we are facing new challenges and uh, we have to ensure that everyone is able to participate remotely from their homes from with whatever setup they have there. Uh, the platform that we are using is WebEx and um, we are using WebEx because it's very straightforward. There's no requirement for any additional download or plugging but most importantly because of the security that it offers. In fact, it's the only platform that the World Bank has found that ensures end-to-end -end encryption. And therefore, it's the only platform that the World Bank has allows to be used for any confidential or work-related matter. So that's what we're using. And um, on, top of the, on top of WebEx, we are also um, 
for uh, hearings that require simultaneous interpretation, we are also using CUDA that Martin mentioned also in his remarks, which also ensures end-to-end -end encryption and uh, therefore also complies with the World Bank's security uh, requirements. Um, other than that, uh, in hearings that we've had recently, like what we also do is we have a, well, a court reporter, a usual court reporter who will listen in and then he will be providing or she will be providing uh, the transcript via a separate browser. And um, I would say as to RM software and platforms, that's always I can add to that. So what um, is, yeah. Har, if I, sorry, if I, if, if I could jump in. So is it, is it WebEx as a matter of course, or could the tribunal and the parties, if they wanted to use a different platform, is, is that possible? And could you also touch on, I think Martin raised some interesting points about transcription and translation. How, do, how does that work virtually? Yes, uh, no. Uh, so at the World Bank, all Wix exit hearings will be with WebEx because that is, I mean, in fact, today I've had to join from my, phone because I'm not allowed to use Zoom on my computer. Um, but um, <laughs> so that's what we're doing. And uh, the, there's no room for, for any changes in that, in that regard. As to transcript, uh, we work with our usual transcript providers, our usual court reporters. They join the hearing like uh, any other participant and they will be providing live notes uh, through a separate browser. So, and then providing the, the transcripts by the end of the day. So in that sense, it's, it's extremely similar to an in-person hearing and you hardly notice any difference. Yeah. And, um, and, and when it comes to simultaneous interpretation, we've actually done a lot of hearings uh, with, uh, remotely with simultaneous interpretation using WebEx and that has been very easy so far. However, now we face the problem that interpreters do not have access to interpreters booths. And therefore we've had to find a platform that allows for interpreters to provide their services from their homes. And the one that we have identified that complies with our uh, security concerns is Kudo, which was also mentioned by Martin. And we've had a couple sessions over the last week and that has worked very well. Mm. Gary, if I, if I could move over to you, uh, both in your capacity as president of the SIC court and, and as counsel, I understand that you participated as counsel in, uh, in a hearing under the auspices of another institution. And of course, as president of the SIC court, you're seeing parties in SIC arbitration starting to take this up more frequently. What's your view uh, on the take up overall utility uh, of, of e-hearings during this time of COVID-19? Well, I, I agree with a, a lot of what um, both both Hara and and Martin have have said. I think one of the key takeaways is that virtual hearings or e hearings are entirely possible. In a sense, they're a development or an evolution of something that's been happening over the past five or ten years. I think both in my experience as counsel, but also at SIC. It's hard to remember a hearing in, in recent years that didn't have some virtual component, either a witness testifying remotely, um, a, a CMC or some other type of, of procedural uh, hearing being conducted by either video conference or telephone. I think the, the real change that has happened over the, the past months has been going from having a piece of hearings to having effectively the entire hearing being conducted virtually and effectively all participants being remote. It's one thing to have a room where the tribunal and counsel are present and one or two or even all witnesses appear remotely. It's something different for everyone to be at home the way we all are today in front of our laptops with nobody uh, in person um, in front of, of the other participants. At SIC, we've, we've been flexible in the sense of whatever platform best suits the, the parties in the tribunal, we, we can accommodate. In, in some instances, because of local internet issues or because of the laptop issues of some participants, one can only use a particular platform or some other platform. And from, I think from our institutional perspective, also from my perspective as counsel, 
this has really underlined the role either of a tribunal secretary on the one hand or an assistant to the tribunal on, on the other hand. I think having someone who has gone through, especially in these early weeks, months, having someone who has gone through a virtual hearing, who knows the sorts of issues, technical and otherwise, that are likely to arise and who can assist the members of, in particular the members of the tribunal, but also counsel in dealing with the technical aspects of a virtual hearing is, is really essential. Historically, obviously, tribunals have, have used secretaries, have used assistants, but I think in, in these times, in virtual hearing times, the role of the secretary or the assistant to the tribunal, or as at SIC, the technically trained counsel is, has become even more important than historically was the case. Yeah, that's part. Of, I, I suppose that's part of the institutional cell. The reason why you're you're going to an institution, and so whether it's a tribunal secretary, you have the institution there to monitor the conduct of the virtual hearing. Uh, Hara, I just want I just wanted to ask ask you: Have you do you have much experience with, as Gary was saying, one of the participants saying that they don't have ac access to the requisite technology, uh, the internet? connection isn't sufficient. Have you seen much of that or have parties been generally reasonably quick to agree on these on these remote means? Well, my, my first experience was a complete virtual hearing, which took place, I think now two, three weeks ago. I feel like time in COVID times uh, just <laughs> moves differently. Um, we, we were scheduled to have an in-person hearing at the beginning of April and we were, it was all planned to do that. And then overnight we had to change to a VC hearing where some people would be participating in London, others in Paris, others in New York and uh, DC. And then um, again, overnight <laughs> we had to adjust it to just WebEx. And obviously some participants were caught by surprise and there was definitely uh, concerns about the witnesses not being able to prepare not having the requisite equipment. And we basically had a week and a half uh, to prepare for everything. And this was the first week and a half of confinement. So yeah. the stress levels and the lack of familiarity with any kind of virtual setting is not the same that uh, we're dealing with now. So our biggest concern was to like test everything a hundred times with everyone. And I think that doing that, we, we were able to to make sure that everyone felt comfortable with the technology. And we had tests with the witnesses, we had tests with the experts, we had tests with the tribunals. And, and I say tests because it was many with many. And, um, and I think that was the key to making sure that everyone had everything they, need, they needed. Um, I mean, from a practical perspective right now, if, if you're going to be planning for a virtual hearing, you probably have more than a week and probably you're also not in the first week where everyone is ordering headsets and speakers and maybe Amazon is able to deliver them on time. So you would be able to, to, to find any city that is sick and receive it on time. Unfortunately for us, that was not the case. So not every speaker or participant was um, and it's with his best voice, but, but it worked well and, and everyone felt comfortable. So it was it actually went very well. Yeah, that, that, that's good to, to know. And that's one of the exciting things that, that may come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, the fact that you have institutions that are ready and able with all of this technology. So even when everyone is able to travel again, uh, certainly for procedural hearings, maybe uh, jurisdiction, whatever, the, and maybe even evidentiary all the way through, I think it's exciting and that there is a time and cost savings and perhaps uh, a wear and tear savings on counsel and arbitrator by using uh, these remote means. Uh, that provides us uh, with some very good background. And with that, uh, let us turn to, to Michael. Uh, Michael, we are, are, are very pleased and, and quite excited uh, about the proposal that you have that we've been discussing for staggered hearing sessions between the tribunal and the parties in circumstances where there may be significant time zone differences. Could you share with us the gen genesis of this proposal and the mechanics, exactly how it would work? Well, this um, <clears throat> idea of mine uh, was inspired by a visit that I made in 2018 to the Hangzhou Internet Court, which many people think is the most technolog technologically advanced court in the world. Um, I won't 
go into the details of the wonders that you can see uh, at, in Hangzhou, but they have a particularly interesting uh, trial system. Uh, they have a separate protocol for what they call asynchronous court trials. I had to look up the dictionary for that. Basically, it means a hearing where not everyone is in the same room at the same time uh, or in the same virtual hearing room at the same time. So their system allows parties to make written and oral submissions separately with the judge. And then it's sort of loaded onto uh, a platform uh, and the other party can then access the platform, learn what has been written and said by the other side. They put their own answer back on the platform and have their own dialogue with the judge. Uh, and then they get together for a final session uh, to argue out um, the merits of the case. So I don't want to go into the detail of that, but that gave me this idea that due process does not require everyone involved in the actual contest to be in the same virtual hearing room at the same time. And you can look at various procedures uh, that go towards the building up of a party's case uh, and being presented to the tribunal and see if certain portions can be done uh, separately uh, and again by one party with a separate reply from the other. Now, of course, there's no problem where the issue is written submissions. And those are, they could be from uh, a matter of choice, uh, be exchanged, uh, or as is equally common, to have them filed consecutively. Uh, it's when you get into the oral uh, arguments, the oral submissions, uh, that traditionally, of course, they are meant to be dealt with together. But my idea is that, and this goes towards the problem that you highlighted, Kevin, which is virtual hearings in principle is fine, but the main difficulty with virtual hearings or international arbitration is the tyranny of distance and time differences for virtual hearings. Uh, because on any given day, if you're having an international arbitration hearing, you could get guys in the US and even the West Coast of US uh, to at, at one extreme, and then on the other extreme, East Asia, uh, and that's already 12, 13 hours in winter, and you know, California will be 15 hours. And then if you add Australia and New Zealand to that, then you know, the time difference between the personnel involved in a virtual hearing uh, is going to be very difficult to overcome. And then you may have to delay things for quite a long time. So I'm talking about cases where we are not going to have the witnesses uh, engaged in this particular exercise. So these are for cases where essentially two parties are arguing a particular point. And of course, one method of dealing with that is to just tell the parties, would you allow the tribunal to deal with this particular issue on the papers alone? And sometimes parties do agree. So that takes care of that particular problem. But there are some applications which are potentially dispositive of the whole case. And then, Council very often will say, look, this is make or break. We need to have that opportunity to address the tribunal orally. Uh, and then you have the problem of the time differences. Uh, theoretically, of course, people can get up early or stay up late, but that imposes a disadvantage on one particular party. So the idea is that you try and break up as much of that process for deciding uh, these separate issues which are which do not turn on having witnesses present to be examined on their evidence 
So these will essentially apply in cases where you have applications which are either dispositive of the whole hearing or will be determinative of particular standalone issues which are important in the case, important enough to warrant an early decision on it. So we're talking typically about objections, challenges based on lack of jurisdiction. That's a very important application. Yeah. It could make or break for the claimant. Uh, and therefore, it requires a lot of effort. And in most of the cases that I've sat in, the parties do want to have the right of an oral hearing. So how do you deal with that kind of situation? Or under SIAC rules, you have early dismissal. Again, that could be dispositive of the whole case, or at least an important part of it. Uh, or you can have applications for freezing orders, which are critically important. Um, and the client will be very unhappy if his lawyer isn't allowed to have uh, an oral uh, session with the um, tribunal. Now, what you then can do is to separate out the filing of the submissions. That's not a problem. But after you have had the exchange of submissions, then you get into the oral arguments. Then at that point, you could have staggered submissions with counsel for one party addressing the tribunal. That's finished. And then that transcript is either loaded onto a platform or a recording is made, sent to the other party. They look at the platform or they look at the recording and then they prepare their own reply and they have a separate session with the tribunal. And then after that is done, the tribunal can say, okay, now we have really understood the issues. We've understood the principal arguments and we'll give the parties one last chance to be face-to-face -face virtually uh, in the same hearing room at the same time, and we will arrange a special session for that. But then the time for that will be much less than if you had had the whole process, the whole hearing process, uh, with everybody trying to get into the same virtual room at the same time. But it, it, it raises a, an interesting question to me because the idea with virtual hearings, are we trying to replicate in-person hearings, or are we trying to figure out a way to do things a bit differently? So under this proposal, you have the claimant makes its submissions, they're recorded or trans transcribed, then the respondent is able uh, to respond to those, and then you bring both parties together. That's a bit different, uh, of course, than what would happen in person. So is the idea to find efficiencies that may not be there in person? Is that what we're aiming for as an arbitration community with these virtual hearings? Yes, as I said, uh, when the chips are really down uh, with regard to a particular application, I expect that quite a lot, if not the majority, of counsel would say we would like to have an oral hearing on this. So all I'm saying is that split up that oral hearing first into your main submissions where you have uh, received the written submissions of the other side, then you want to address um, the tribunal orally uh, rather than with a responsive uh, submission uh, because counsel think that they can put over their case more effectively with a combination of a written submission plus an oral submission. So you give them that opportunity, but it doesn't have to be at the same time. Yeah. It's, Except it's, for it's, a limited period. Yeah. And then yeah. the tyranny of distance hopefully will be resolved that way. You, you, you need some, what you need is perhaps a minimum of a couple of hours, maybe three hours, depending on how big the time difference is. Yeah. Uh, ten, tangentially related, but, uh, but I, I couldn't be on a webinar with you without asking about advocacy. Of course, you've written extensively on advocacy and one of my favorites that I think I looked at a, a, about a decade ago is your famous questions not to ask uh, in cross-examination. So how does it work in a cross done virtually? Is there a different set of questions not to ask 
And what do you see the, as the difference, both, both from the council side and arbitrator side in cross-examination done virtually? Okay, that uh, article um, was written about cross-examination of witnesses in an evidentiary hearing. Mm. Uh, what I've been talking about so far is outside of the evidentiary hearing. Yeah. And uh, I think there's no uh, rule book which says how tribunals should ask questions of counsel uh, and vice versa. Um, but that really said, uh, moves me on to the next stage that if we have, as for example, I will be doing next month uh, and we're gonna have a session with the uh, council as to how we want to do the virtual hearing, um, the time differences are not very great in this case. So we don't have a real problem because uh, it's basically Singapore, Australia, and, uh, and China. But um, if you had to do a full virtual trial uh, with evidentiary hearing, then I would, if I were uh, sole uh, arbitrator or chair of the tribunal, uh, assemble a case management conference at some point not right at the beginning, but at some point after the witness statements have been filed so that we can see what the witness statements say. And the tribunal could do a preliminary analysis of those witness statements and call the parties together and says, well, we've looked at it and we understand that some of it will require cross-examination, but other parts we think the, the uh, witness statements speak for themselves or you can deal with the uh, evidence given in their witness statements by written submissions at the appropriate time. And you try and persuade the council to cut down on their estimated cross-examination time and really think hard about whether or not it is really necessary for them to reduce. Or tribunal could simply impose a guillotine, which they can do in any event, even with uh, an ordinary hearing with all the witnesses present. And, uh, but the method I'm suggesting of trying to persuade counsel to cut down on their cross-examination time uh, would uh, hopefully then reduce the total number of hours required to deal with that whole hearing uh, with all the witnesses uh, to something manageable because the only other solution you have if all the council insist on having their full cross-examination rights and for a normal five day they would estimate five days for a normal case yeah. well if you have virtual hearing and your time available uh, for the virtual hearing is limited simply by the tyranny of distance then a five-week trial may end up double that time, maybe even treble that time. And if that's the price that people are prepared to pay, so be it. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, it's a very interesting uh, analysis. Gary, I, I wanted to put something to you on witnesses and evidence. Uh, in your experience, uh, I suppose, both as counsel and arbitrator, would the suitability of a virtual hearing depend uh, in part on the issues and the evidence if there's what if there's a case where there's a particular focus on witness testimony? Would you say that some hearings should be pushed back and wait for an in-person phase? Does it depend a little bit on the case? Uh, what has been your experience, Gary? Uh, I'd like to go back. Me, uh, so, sorry, Gary, but uh, maybe just to clarify what uh, Kevin is asking. Um, are you asking whether or not you can have you know, one rule uh, applying to all cases, you know, one, one principle uh, about the necessity for cross-examination and the length of the cross-examination. Uh, uh, if you're asking me that, I mean, the short answer is no. I mean, the short answer is yes. I mean, every case needs to be analyzed uh, on its particular facts and the particular witness statements given. Uh, but my general approach is that in commercial arbitration, international commercial arbitration, the tendency is that the kind of issues that counsel really need to cross-examine on come up much less often 
than in general litigation in court. Because we don't do crime, we don't do divorce, we don't do defamation. Those are the kind of cases that you have to have heavy cross-examination. Yeah. Uh, commercial uh, arbitration, which is based on contract, you are do looking at what the contract says, what the contract means, and what happened. And, you know, well, what is the legal outcome of that? I'm sorry, mm -hmm. did uh, Gary want to chip in? I'm going back to, I think, uh, Kevin's, Kevin's question, and, and just really briefly, I think the goal of virtual hearings shouldn't be to replicate an in-person hearing. In a sense, more technology means we should be able to do things better. That said, I do think we need to be careful about the concept of due process, which applies just as much to virtual hearings as it did to traditional hearings. There's authority in Europe under continental Europe, that is, under the UNCTRA model law, that if a party requests a hearing, it's entitled to an in-person hearing, a, in the words of these authorities, a real hearing, not a virtual hearing. And due process in those kinds of jurisdictions might well put limitations or even prohibitions on any sort of, of virtual hearing. I think apart from those jurisdictions, which hopefully are a distinct minority, in most cases, a virtual hearing should be able to provide the same opportunity to be heard for the parties as a traditional in-person hearing. And going back to something I mentioned in passing, perhaps in some circumstances, a virtual hearing is, is even better than an in-person hearing because of the technological features of it. I do think that a lot depends on the specificities of a particular case. Witness examination is necessarily more difficult because of the time lag, because of um, the difficulties inherent in displaying documents. Those can be overcome, but they remain difficulties because of issues with respect to at least the potential for, for witness coaching, because of counsel's lack of immediacy with the, the tribunal, even if they're all in the same virtual hearing space. But all of those can be addressed. And in some ways, having the witness right in front of you on the screen provides a better measure, not a worse measure of, of witness credibility. I think in, in an odd way, going back to something that, that Hara said, um, time really does move differently in COVID era. And time zones in particular are in many ways the biggest obstacle to, to virtual hearings. I think though, staying up later and getting up earlier as Hara has done um, this morning for her, um, provides um, a fairly ready solution for, for most cases. I think we have to recognize that hearing times may be shorter, which may lead to longer hearing periods, but shorter amounts of time each day with more breaks. But in a sense, there's no, there's no rule book for this and individual tribunals working with individual sets of counsel need to develop solutions that are, as arbitration always is, hand tailored to the specificities of a particular case. In, in my experience thus far, tribunals have, have in fact been doing that and doing it pretty well. Mm. Hara, uh, I'll turn it over to you. And I was wondering, it's a little bit of an arbitration boogeyman to a certain degree, this concern about witness coaching, um, potential recording. What what plat what do the platforms provide in order to prevent this in terms of camera angles to make sure that the entire room is shown? Can you give us a bit of the exit experience and to help give comfort to users on the use of these mechanisms? Yes, uh, well, in my particular hearing, uh, because everyone was confined at home and uh, the, the, like the, this risk or concern did not arise and people just trusted that everyone was was doing their best to connect and, and leave it at that. But obviously this is a concern that we are looking into and there are different solutions that can be used. And we've found 
um, with a system from some arbitrators, a camera that's called the OWL camera, and that provides you a 360 uh, uh, view of the room at all times. So it would be like a, an additional participant that would appear on our screen in the thumbnail would be a, a whole view of the room. Another option is for the witness or the expert that is testifying to be looking at a laptop and then have, for example, the, the phone behind the person. And, and then you could also see the room and see that he's not looking at any notes or, or being coached in any other way. Something that Gary mentioned, and I think is very true, is that when you're on screen and you're looking at the witness, like it's, if you have a big screen, the witness is going to look huge. And um, it's very easy if they're not looking at the camera, if they're, if, if they're looking at something, like you immediately pick up on that. So that's another, another thing that parties will be looking for. Um, and then like other than that, uh, I think that a lot of the challenges that you have about witness coach, uh, coaching or uh, uh, are the same that you would find in an in-person hearing. So, so you probably would look at um, adjusting the schedule to allow for a witness to just participate in one blog and, and avoid as many breaks as possible during that testimony. If, if you do have breaks, then I guess the, the witness can stay on screen with the person from the institution, make sure that they're not communicating with anyone during the break. So there are different ways to deal with this. And, and I think we're all willing to be creative to ensure that everyone is uh, sufficiently um, at ease with what is going forward. Could I uh, and, and just to, to, just to, Kevin, to ask a question? Michael, go ahead. Uh, in, in response to Gary's um, uh, admin admonition uh, about the dangers of uh, virtual hearings you know, violating some countries' idea of due process, uh, wouldn't that, uh, could that, a solution to that particular problem be simply for all of the appropriate, sorry, all, all of the uh, institutions to simply amend their rules so as to expressly allow uh, hearing, virtual hearings, you know, uh, even for the full uh, process of the full uh, evidentiary hearing. I'm not sure that's a question, but if, it, if it's a question to me, I think, uh, firstly, we're not operating under those rules at the moment. Most institutional rules give us a, a tribunal of a fair amount of discretion in terms of how they conduct the, the hearings, but most institutional rules have embedded in them almost the same concept that you find in the model law of, of a hearing. Uh, even if we did amend our rules um, and other institutions have not leapt to the notion of cross-institution consolidation, so I'm, I'm not sure that institutions will necessarily amend their rules overnight, but uh, assuming they did, one would still encounter issues with respect to statutory and in a few countries, constitutional requirements with, with mm. respect due process that um, I suspect absent a specific waiver from parties would be difficult to contract out of. All that said, um, my very strong sense from most jurisdictions around the world is that vir virtual witness testimony for individual witnesses in the past was, was well accepted. The move to a virtual hearing, that means all witnesses and all oral submissions, um, I don't think is, is a huge step. I think courts in some countries, there are trial courts in the United States that have conducted all of their hearings virtually, albeit without the time zone differences, or at least not without much time zone differences. And thus, I think that due process concerns, although real in some individual cases, shouldn't, as a matter of principle, prevent any tribunals from going forward with considering virtual hearings in, in individual cases. I could just jump in there as well. I, I, I think oh, that there's Martin, also a Martin, question. welcome back. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. No, I, I, I think there's also a question of, of changing, evolving mores and involving standards there. I mean, if you look at the literature from the early 2000s, you'll see lots of articles talking about how virtual hearings are not yet possible and do violate due process. And if you look at the more recent literature, you see exactly this, this movement from, you know, how do we replicate and, and is the objective to replicate the in-person hearing to, hey, how much more efficiency can we actually obtain out of a, 
a, a, a virtual hearing and, and, and what more we can do. Although I think there's also additional challenges in, in the sense that, that uh, there's also equality concerns, um, especially if, if one party is well set up and able to participate in a, in a very fluid fashion and then the other party um, is, is not able to, to participate in, in the same degree. And I think that's where some interesting creative thinking, just as uh, Dr. Huang has, has put forward, is, uh, is, is where things ought to be going, is, is how, do we, how do we leverage this, this technology to, to improve arbitration instead of just do the same thing we've always been doing. Mm. Uh, looking at uh, sort of a particularly nuanced uh, issue, Martin, I've been saving up questions uh, for you, so I have plenty. <laughs> if you could uh, give our uh, attendees a bit of an idea of how PCA deals with parallel communication. So what if counsel needs to be discussing with uh, the instructing clients, deliberations of the tribunal? Do these platforms allow these kind of parallel communications? So some of them do. Some of them have, in fact, built in virtual breakout rooms, which, which can work quite well um, there in order to, to once again try to replicate a little bit of what we do in, in, in real life. Um, in addition, I, I think there's quite a lot of, of parallel channels that can be run. And, and in our experience, you, you have some teams which are running a a separate what WhatsApp chat, and in particular for interpreters, which I think is is one of the uh, the bigger technical challenges, that they actually run a, a parallel video stream so that they're able to to truly more smoothly signal to each other when they're trying to do a handoff um, in 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 interpretation is is really one of the things that we've that we've found they. Concerns on the flip side is you run too many video streams, one starts interfering with the other and, and you start uh, dividing your bandwidth, um, which is always scarce. Yeah, and, and touching on the, Martin, staying with you and touching on the due process concern, are you seeing uh, parties and tribunals, are they incorporating the various arbitration soft law that we have? You see the sole protocol, the CIR guidelines of witnessing witness conferencing that was launched in Singapore. You've got the uh, uh, Delos dispute checklist. What do you see being incorporated? What are parties agreeing on to help provide some structure through these virtual hearings? Uh, I, I think it's very much a moving target. Uh, I mean, you've, you've got an admirable, admirable uh, number of, of initiatives of this kind for the common good. And, um, but I, I, I think it's, it's a, a rapidly evolving field, and, and that's why w what I've actually observed with a number of our tribunals is actually to say, hey, you know what, let's not try to regulate this all up front um, while the technology is evolving, let alone the, the, the standards. Let's lay down a few ground rules, and then let's move forward, and then it's at the time of a pre-hearing procedural conference, um, which can actually double as a good test run for, for the actual hearing, that you can discuss the, the, the very nitty gritty of, of exactly how it's going to work and how it, mm. everybody's expectations can be met. In, in, in terms of the, the discretion of tribunals to conduct hearings by virtual means, I, I think the UNCTRAL rules are quite clear on that. Uh, the SIC rules afford a lot of discretion, even referencing in the emergency arbitrator provisions uh, that it can be done by these virtual means. Have you, have you seen parties arguing this? Uh, do institutional rules need to evolve and update to make it even more express or have you not seen it be an issue? I, I think it is an issue and, and I think it's, it's, it's maybe that, that very gray area of legal certainty. The more certainty you can provide and, and avoid the debate even yeah. being raised in the first place is, is I think the, the ultimate objective. Um, I, I, I think the fact that, that most national courts are, are, are making pretty significant moves in this direction is, is also giving some comfort to arbitrators in, 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 in what uh, the definition of, of that sort of due process is. I, I suppose in the intervening time, and I would like to get Gary's views on, on this in particular, is because if you have an arbitration clause that provides for the venue of the arbitration is in Singapore, that does give some latitude for a party uh, to demand, no, we want an in-person hearing in Singapore. What is the nationality? What is the jurisdiction of the venue? 
when it's being conducted by virtual means. So, Gary, do you see from a, an advisory standpoint, should parties be making this a bit more express in arbitration agreements going forward, or are the institutional rules, SIC rules, and control rules, ICSID, are, are these robust enough to allow for uh, uh, virtual hearings to the extent that you can say? Great. That's a great set of set of questions, Kevin. <laughs> we'll no doubt be addressing those in our upcoming rules revision to the SIC <laughs> rules, which we're going to kick off later later next month. Um, a, few, a few answers, though. First, I don't think that arbitration clauses that that select either Singapore or somewhere else as the seat of the arbitration provide much of a basis for parties to argue that the hearing therefore must be physically present in, in Singapore or, or anywhere else. Most institutional rules, the model law, other national laws give the tribunal discretion to conduct the hearing physically um, somewhere other than the arbitral seat. The selection of the arbitral seat is, as commentators tell us, a choice of law, not a choice of geographical location. And as I think a couple speakers have already underlined, a tribunal has broad discretion in any event with respect to the conduct of the hearing. The hearing in a very real sense remains in Singapore or wherever it's been seated, even if it's conducted, conducted virtually. All that said, I think institutions will want to give some thought to underscoring the possibility of both virtual witness testimony and virtual hearings in upcoming rules revisions. I think tribunals already clearly have that power, um, but just as we augmented the rule by making clear the tribunal's power to dismiss claims or defenses on an early basis, I think underscoring the possibility, the legitimacy in principle of a virtual hearing in institutional rules makes sense. One final thought though, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that no matter what institutional rules say, parties will, as a mandatory matter, always be entitled to both equality of treatment and an opportunity in the language of the Institutional Model Law, full opportunity to, to be heard to present their cases. Parties argue today and they will argue tomorrow and next year and following rules revisions that in certain circumstances a virtual hearing either doesn't ensure equality of treatment or alternatively doesn't on the specific facts of their case give them an opportunity to be heard. I can say from my own experience that cross-examining a witness virtually is very different from cross-examining a witness in person. It's one thing to be sitting next to team members, to be looking at the tribunal in real time, not in a thumbnail, but in real time, watching the tribunal's reactions and the opposing counsel's reactions all, again, physically and in real time, is a very different experience than the sort of experience that we have now. I think part of the solution to those changed circumstances is multiple screens. I think anyone who's done a virtual hearing knows that two screens probably isn't enough. You need a screen for documents, you need a screen for the whole hearing room, and you need a screen for the witness. But adjusting to, to those technical changes and also ensuring other communication channels is, is absolutely essential in those cases where a tribunal goes ahead and orders virtual hearings. I think some tribunals at, at, at the moment are desisting from doing that. They're hoping that lockdown circumstances end in a reasonable amount of time and therefore not ordering virtual hearings. Other tribunals obviously do the opposite, but some tribunals are holding off I don't know how those reactions will play out, though, if lockdown circumstances aren't foreseen as ending in the reasonably near term. Justice delayed, as one always says, can be justice denied, and simply putting hearings on hold isn't an adequate solution in, in many cases. Mm. 
We, Gary, we have a we have a few minutes left. If you were if you were crystal ball gazing a little bit, and if you were looking maybe just a year ahead, is our virtual hearings going to become the new normal for SIC? Are you going to see this going forward, even once, uh, say, the circuit breakers and the lockdowns go away, or do you envision a very busy in-person hearing schedule in 2021 because there's been a lot of adjournments. Where do you see this going and where is SIC going? I'm, I'm notoriously bad at gazing into, <laughs> into virtual balls or, or virtual screens, um, but, I'll, but I'll try. First, I think as, as Hara said at, at the outset, um, there's been an evolution over the last 10 years towards some elements of virtual hearings. And I think that our experience over the last months and the coming months will accelerate and accentuate that process. There will be more remote testimony. There will be more case management conferences and, and in some circumstances, um, oral submissions um, virtually. I think that there will always be a fairly strong bias towards in-person hearings. I think the amount of information that can be gained from having everyone physically present in the same room for a sustained period of time is, is hard to replicate technologically. It's not to say you can't come close to doing it, and as I mentioned previously, in some ways perhaps even improve upon it, but actually having everybody present in the same geographical venue brings huge benefits. So I suspect for larger cases, those types of hearings won't go away. I suspect though for smaller cases and in particular perhaps cases where witness testimony is not particularly important, we'll see an, a, a greater move towards, towards virtual hearings. I'm a little skeptical about the Hangzhou internet courts solution. It, someone once said about the writing requirement for arbitration clauses in some countries, the Munster Trial Model Law, that written really means oral uh, because you can agree orally to an arbitration agreement. Um, it strikes me that the Hangzhou Court's solution is really the opposite. It's oral means written. I think what most parties won't want the opportunity just to listen to their opponents, their adversaries' submissions after they've been made and then to reply by recording. I think most council will choose to stay up a little bit later, or get up a little bit earlier. But I do think, going back to your question, that there's going to be a lot more use of technology in the coming years than it, we saw a couple decades ago. Hmm. Martin, if I, if I could throw it over to you, uh, just in, in closing, if there's a message that you could give to PCA or potential PCA users on virtual hearings, uh, PCA's overall readiness during this pandemic, what would that be? And I, I think it would be that the future is here. And, and I mean, to do that, that crystal ball gazing that, that Gary was hesitating, I think we're, we, we have a very busy fall in, in store because I, I, I hope just as everyone does that, that we'll be uh, through this soon. But I think because of the experience that we've had, we've got a lot of hearings that have been rescheduled in person. And on top of that, we'll have a whole bunch of virtual hearings um, to contend with even when we're back to, to, to normal times, hopefully. Yep. And of, and of course, we have you as our neighbors in Maxwell Chambers Suites. Uh, it's very exciting to have PCA administering cases out of, out of Singapore. Uh, Hara, how about with ICSID? We've all been uh, watching uh, the rule re revision with great interest. What, is, what do you see looking ahead for ICSID virtual hearings and the overall direction? Uh, well, I, I, I think that as Gary maybe mistakenly forecasted, but I, I'm going to agree nonetheless, uh, I think we will be seeing more virtual hearings. I think that in cases where it's a one day hearing where there's no examination, that is probably going to be happening uh, virtually a lot more often. And I do think that we're going to have a lot more virtual components in hearings because people are going to feel more comfortable with the, with the platforms. I think maybe we will move more into the hub hearings where like teams are together so that you can still pass on post-its, which I think is a, is a significant uh, uh, thing that is missing. Um, but um, 
from my experience and our experience so far, I think virtual hearings can happen. I think uh, we're ready and we're capable to assist parties in making sure that they're comfortable with the technology, which I think is the key part. And we are able to offer them uh, everything they need to conduct a secure hearing in that is as close to in-person as possible in the current mm -hmm. circumstances. And then going forward, I'm sure that we will leverage on this technology to make hearings more efficient and proceedings more cost effective. Yeah, I think I think it's one of those things for arbitration users when they see the institutions, ICSID, PCA, SIC, when they have this uh, domain knowledge, the, the hardware and the software, and they know that it can be done. And once you start using it, I think it's going to become more and more common. Uh, Michael, it must remain for me to ask if you have any closing thoughts. I think this is your 51st year of practice. You have really seen the gamut in Singapore dispute resolution. Where do you, where do you see this going? Uh, where do you see Singap Singapore fitting in? Who is Singapore almost always being at the front of the curve for these things? Um, I think that this COVID experience is going to make uh, our legal profession, including our uh, overseas arbitration lawyers who are uh, practicing in Singapore, to be uh, more aware of how technology can assist us. Uh, I see, for example, one particular area where uh, it will, um, in, in my view, improve the quality of uh, arbitration administration. Uh, and that is in the CMC. Now, the case management conference uh, has in recent years been emphasized by most institutions as being uh, an important part uh, of the whole administration of the case by the tribunal. And um, when I first started practice, ICC was the one who insisted that we have physical meetings, uh, but it was really very expensive uh, to fly, you know, to London or wherever, uh, just to have a half day hearing, which is what most uh, hearings uh, took in terms of time. Um, and so eventually um, the practice has grown up that case management conferences are usually done by telephone. Uh, and sometimes, you know, that isn't quite, doesn't quite work so well when the uh, tribunal is not so familiar with the uh, lawyers on each side. Um, and now that we've been introduced to Zoom and find how easy it is, um, I think that is going to become much more uh, used by practitioners in arbitration, particularly from different uh, countries. Uh, and of course, how you develop uh, the benefits you see from being able to uh, meet virtually uh, could be then extended to the cases that I've been discussing where there are important decisions uh, to be argued and made by the tribunal outside of the main evidentiary hearing. And I foresee more use of uh, virtual hearings for those kind of uh, applications um, and so eventually we may progress to complete virtual hearings uh, for certain classes of cases uh, where, where parties can then see the savings and expense compared to the cost of hotels and uh, uh, you know, aeroplane fares. So I think incrementally we can only get more involved with technology and the COVID uh, is a great introduction uh, to the new world that we are seeing around us now. Yeah. Well, that, uh, what, what a perfect way to conclude on an inspiring note. Uh, Michael, I would like to thank you and Gary in particular, showing us the council perspective, the international arbitrator perspective, uh, Martin and Hara from an ins one institutional represented, re representative to uh, another. Uh, we always like being able to get together with the institutions. I think that ICSID and PCA have very unique uh, experience in this area. All of the institutions are looking at each other and, and working together to really improve the user experience. And that is really one of the heartening things uh, about this difficult COVID-19 situation. So thank you to all of our panelists and thank you as well 
to all of the attendees that have been turning up for all of these webinar sessions. We have another one scheduled for tomorrow and we've had thousands of attendees from all around the world and getting your questions and your feedback really helps us improve the user experience because that's what we try to do at SIC is listen to our users and put the put these aspects into practice. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our attendees. I wish everyone uh, a good day or a good evening in Singapore in the relevant time zones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night.